Welcome to Calvary Bible Baptist Church. Uh, we're in our Bible study tonight, Romans chapter 14, verse 5. Romans chapter 14, verse 5. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks, and he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. Let's open a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of the Christian. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your blessings, and your truth. We thank you for all that we have. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, now what we're dealing with here in the book of Romans is holy days and, and things like that. What has happened is the light of life has come into the world in the Lord Jesus Christ. Theocracy has rejected the king. And now the theocracy is going to be rejected. The Bible is very clear. He was in the world, and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not, and yet he lived in the world. He came into his own, this is Israel, and his own received him not. But as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, what you're dealing with in a historical context is the crucifiers of Christ are Rome and the Roman government, and Israel, the Jewish nation. So you're getting the world, and you're getting God's own people, which is a horrible thing. When both of them reject him, and in conspiring together, they send him to the cross to be crucified, not knowing that it is God's will that one man should die for the nation. But ironic, Caiaphas prophesies it in the betrayal and in his sense and in the Sanhedrin sense, the murder of Christ. Now you get into stating, making statements like that, you'll get into Christians offended because they think they know everything and they don't because they don't realize and understand time and judgment place and position I once watched two Christians fight over this um, Jesus said that no man took his life from him that he laid it down that's absolutely true but Stephen also said ye men with wicked hands have taken and crucified the just one which is also true now, if the Lord hadn't surrendered and submitted himself to his Father's will, then men could not have evilly been responsible for crucifying and murdering him. But when he submitted himself and he said of his face to the Lord of Israel, they did not have to, the Roman uh, representative and Pilate did not have to be unjust, having ruled and found Christ without fault. He had no justification to turn him over to the Jews for crucifixion. He was their Messiah. No man could do the miracles. One of the Sanhedrin, no man could do these miracles except God be with him. It was observed by um, both Joseph of Arimathea A lot of them did was recognize that he was the Christ. The miracles were self-evident. Yet, the blindness and wickedness of man, the two governments conspired for the crucifixion of Christ and are therefore responsible. Now, you have to be very careful with truth because how the truth misapplied. Hitler justified the attempted extermination of the Jewish people saying they were Christ killers <laughs> when he was trying to head up the powers of this world which was also Christ killers and in a true sense every sinner is responsible for the death of Christ because he had to die for us to be forgiven and up until 
God's conversion of my soul. Even though I would have told people I was a Christian because I was born in a Christian culture and went to some Christian churches, but I was really ignorant of the truth of the gospel and the truth of the scriptures. And I only knew myself to be a Christian by birth, not by second birth, until second birth and the opening of my eyes and the reading of the scriptures and coming to the truth. I'd like those people would have been consenting to his death. Also, the scriptures cover that all the people were consenting on his death. And even his own disciples forsook him when they should have stood with him. So the whole world ends up responsible for the crucifixion of Christ, and it is a murder because God allowed it to take place does not negate the fact that the people that commit it are responsible for murder. Now I know a lot of Christians see it in a lot of different ways. And that's the way I see it from reading scripture. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But as many as received him to get to them gave him power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Of course, my conversion is believing on his name correctly. It's not a secret or magic name. It's Jesus. It's Jehovah's salvation. The purpose of Christ's name, Jesus, is the purpose of his work on earth to redeem mankind, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. God was willing that none should perish. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not a son of the world to destroy the world, but the world through him might be saved. And the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Christian walk in the spirit should be filled with grace and truth. You shouldn't have a problem with the truth, and you should have grace for those that are in blindness and darkness and can't see the truth. So now what we're dealing with here is holy days. And what I wanted you to see there's a transition for the body of Christ. Now we're placing the nation until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. I wanted you to see this biblically in its historical and prophetic nature. And so all Israel shall be saved as written, for it shall come out of Zion the river, and shall turn away on godliness from Jacob. Hitler's truth has no justification for the anti-Semitic, anti-Israel personality of men and the devil. You cannot justify hating God's people because of their blindness. So I'm not anti-Semitic in any way kingdoms of the world are becoming anti-Semitic because of their hatred towards God. Now we come to the question that comes up in holy days, which people will kill you for, and the Bible tells you very clearly, don't make a big deal out of it. But again, these are the things that drive the blind and the wicked harm of others in their blindness and ignorance and pride and lack of understanding of the truth of God's word. You see, Holy Days belongs, and I wanted you to see, to the national entity of Israel. And on the first day, there should be a holy convocation. On the seventh day, there should be a holy convocation to you. No manner of work should be done in them, save that which every man must eat that only may be done of him. So holy days came into their prominence 
to the nation being established under God and the holy days for to teach the Jewish people truths and principles of God. For the church, there are no scriptures that holy days for the church, the body, as there was for the nation. And this day shall be unto you for memorial keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations, and you shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Now, we'll get into what people will start fighting and killing over. We'll look at holy days. We'll start with Sunday. Sunday worship as a Christian disciple was set in a precedent not by the word of God, not by the revelation of the Holy Spirit, but was established by the conduct of the early body of believers and not by scripture. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Up until this time, under the nation of Israel, Israel's holy day was Saturday, the Sabbath. It was the last day of the week. Our Lord and Savior was crucified, buried, and rose on the first day of the week. The disciples met and gathered on the first day of the week because they had just spent the Sabbath day raging in the synagogue of the Jews trying to bring the knowledge of salvation to Sunday worship was established by the conduct of the early church, not by scriptural decree. So Christians worshiping on other days of the week are not in sin to do so if they're doing it to avoid persecution and other reasonable reasons. There's no law Tuesday, every Thursday, or whatever they would choose. But most Christians have chosen to follow the precedent set by the early Christians after the resurrection of the Lord and Savior on the first day of the week for the various reasons that the early church met on Sunday. Sunday worship say again, was established by the conduct of the early church, not by scriptural decree. So Christians worshiping other days of the week are not in sin to do so. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gathering when I come. Now as a pastor and being led of the Lord, the Holy Spirit led me to follow tradition to speak in Christianity because in America there is absolutely no reason, cause, or justification not to do so. We are not hunted out and searched and found and discovered because we're meeting on the first day of the week yet. I say this because if we ever come into those times that we'd have to meet secretly as some of our early founding fathers did and even as some Christians in some parts of the world must do today then we need not allow the devil to tempt us and push us into meeting necessarily on a Sunday and thereby being discovered and destroyed. Now that historical reality this time, but it could come back if we're drawn into tribulation. However, in my opinion, and I'm going to give you opinion because we have no scriptural mandate 
preacher, I'm going to give you opinion. To do so without cause or duress by hostile circumstances is simply not wise in establishing decency and order. Let all things be done decently and in order. This is a much neglected scriptural verse necessary for human training, discipleship, leading, for good operating of local congregations throughout the world. There needs to be decency and order in conduct. And if you start arbitrarily meeting on other days of the week, you're going to break that desire and hope of decency and order. So it's not wise to cast aside centuries of precedent set by the early church, in my opinion. I have not done so, I will not do so, and unless so needed to avoid discovery government and its danger to life and limb, I see no reason for Christians to do anything but follow the traditions set down through two millennia of history. But the truth still needs to be taught. Let all things be done decently in order. Yet there is nothing that indicates in any way that Christians should observe the Sabbath as required by the nation. The Sabbath is a Jewish necessity under law. There was a meeting on the last day of the week. And obviously, the New Testament church and the New Testament disciples, the apostles and the apostles' doctrine, chose to meet in their fellowship on the first day of the week following the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So, this was extremely important in the times of the early church because there is a Judaizing attempt to undermine the local body and church with Israel who had been put away. Sunday is not the Sabbath as it is the first day of the week, whereas the Sabbath is the last day of the week. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. The Sabbath was Saturday, the seventh day, the Jewish holy day, every week, in which no work or manner of servitude Sunday was the first day of the week of which the Lord resurrected and one more time it started a precedent with the early church meeting on the first day of the week and thereafter a precedent set by the actions of disciples and Christians not of scriptures that followed two millennia. Sunday, we're not decreed, is a very fitting day for Christians meeting together, as it was the day of the resurrection and beginning the first day of the week, which is always a new beginning. And that should be emphasized, the spirit that meeting on Sunday has with a newborn babe in Christ and Christians. It's the beginning of a new week, like in a new birth. Now when Jesus, whoops, now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, okay, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils, and she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. Now they were in mourning and weeping on the Sabbath, and of course, to get the 
passing it down the study of scriptures in the crucifixion week the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified on Wednesday he was three days and three nights in high earth he was crucified on sundown Wednesday and he rose early in the morning on Sunday and he had three days he had Thursday Friday and Saturday sundown to sundown Saturday being a Sabbath scriptures are very clear in John. Friday was a high Sabbath where it was the feast of first fruits. And then Thursday was the Passover which began in the evening on Wednesday night. Three days and three nights scripture the scriptures cannot be broken. And the tradition Easter and Christmas were discussed are totally unbiblical. They were not established by the early church. They were established by state-run religions later in history. The lost people pay attention to what Christians do on Sunday to see if you are faithful in attending fellowship as commanded. Now, what's commanded for Christians is the not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. Not meeting on Sunday becomes very vain, as the lost world considers Sunday as the meeting day of Christians on a 2,000-year precedent, and they are interested in your agenda. So you're going to be counterproductive to the gospel and Christian testimony if you see the need other than extreme persecution, in my opinion, to break the precedence of Sunday worship. Not meeting on Sunday becomes vain. And why? None of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Where we have liberty, too many Christians, at least professing Christians, especially in this age, in the Laodicea church age, are using their liberty to justify rebellion. testimony and we're being watched by a lost world the bottom line is that when it comes to Sunday or Christmas or Easter or any other day make sure that when you observe that day or choose not to observe that day you honor God whatever you do and this is very important for whether we live we live unto the Lord and whether we die we die unto the Lord whether we live there for or die we are the Lord now, in learning history and the scriptures, and the information I'm about to tell you is found in encyclopedias as well as the scriptures. Neither Christmas nor Easter, though perceived to be Christian holy days, have never really been holy days. Established by states, not by scripture or by conduct of Christians. The Lord was most likely crucified. And I don't have a long time to go into this, it cannot be proven. Around March or April in the landing season. And in your King James Bible, it's very precise. When it deals in Acts, and it talks about after Easter and the Passover, it separates them. Passover is the Jewish holy day, which would be your scriptural day. In 
Easter was a pagan holiday that has a history in many pagan cultures and deals much with Solus's worship, which was December 21st, but they celebrated in that time period. That's why in some cultures you even have a song. Nobody knows why. That's why we go to the Christmas. Solstice, and you're dealing with that time period from the winter solstice on the 21st in that early part of January when the sun starts returning. And that's a whole Bible study. I don't have time to get into that. Now, my recommendation, and I've tried to do this, it, it makes Christians appear today as a cult and non-Christian if you totally eradicate any type of Christian worship on Christmas or Easter. There are cults that do this because they're armed with knowledge. They have no, no charity. Now let's talk about the charity I found. And they are labeled as cults because the rest of their testimony is not scriptural, not just that. Then on the other hand, you have the truth, and there's no way in the world the Lord was, cruci uh, was born with the shepherds in the field in December, late December, too cold. shepherds are only in the field during the lambing season. But why study history? Why worry about the truth <laughs> when you want to create a myth? What I've found, though, the lost, not understanding and having knowledge, become more open to the gospel and witness because they believe and they've been led and trained to believe that Christmas time is a time of peace. Because there's a twisting. You see, the angels were talking of a different peace. They weren't talking about world peace. They were talking about peace from God to men in Christ. And the world thinks of, oh, we'll stop fighting wars and have world peace. Well, the truth is, if everybody repented their sins and trust Christ and had peace with God, they'd have peace with one another. But they're not the same peace. My peace I give unto you, not as the world give I unto you. What I've done, for me, is to eliminate all the heathenness in these two so-called Christian holy days and try to live them totally for the Lord. I have tried to avoid religious, not biblical, symbolism. When we would have celebrate Christmas, we would get up on Christmas Day and I'd have my children read out of the scriptures Christmas story, and then we give presents in remembering the Lord Jesus Christ, and we taught our children, we're giving these presents to you because we love you the way God loved us, and God gave us a gift of his son for our salvation, and we gave him the gospel. And why the Lord Jesus Christ? I eliminated Santa Claus because he's in a circus, and the people don't realize how deceptively wicked it is. They don't realize what they're doing with Santa Claus. He's, they don't realize that they are subliminally justifying a second story man. A man coming to your house and breaking in. A man bringing booze. Living kind of a debauched 
life, giving away gifts, and nobody tells you where he got them from. I guess he just made them up in his little workshop. But nobody paid for them. You see, it's the same myth that's found in socialism and communism. But that's a whole nother Bible thing. In order for God to give us a gift of eternal life, he had to pay a price that required the sacrifice of his life on Calvary's cross for seven years ago. In order for me or you to give gifts to your children, there has to be a sacrificial earning or making or procuring. Things just don't appear on a fat, drunken, smoking slave by the spring. Now I know this would mark me as a terrible person to tell you the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So it's a free country. Do what you want. I just recommend that you eliminate Jesus truly be the reason for the season. You see, you can say that was biblical slaves as long as you don't really do it. But when you really do it, does it really matter to you? And you don't figure it out now. Same thing with Easter. You can call it Resurrection Sunday. I preach the truth, teach the scriptures. And I'm not interested in chocolate get offended at that. They can't handle the truth. You can't handle the truth, can you? The truth just makes you mad. And if you really would just receive the truth, you could still have the good the good things. You don't have to you just need to get rid of the falsehood. Oh woe is me. Preach and teach the truth of God's word and be despised and rejected for the truth's sake. So I recommend as serpents and harmless as doves. A godly character has real impact on lost people, and they take note of such character. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And if a Christian would preach the truth in love, tell the truth in love like a hat. I'm not telling you have to do anything. I'm just giving you the truth. And I'm just giving you exhortation to live the truth as truthful. I am not trying to take away holy days, but then for the Christian there is no holy day. This is what the scriptures teach us. They belong to state theocracies, But I also say this, as you live your life, you need to keep in mind that someone has his eye on you, and that's all the truer when you are a Christian. Now that may not seem just, but it is true. But he that's joined on the Lord is one spirit, three fornication. Every sin that a man doth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Sum it all up. One more time. There are no holy days in the New Testament set by decree from God for the body of Christ, the church. We are at complete liberty to establish them in who we are. Those that we are aware of have either been established by 
governmental decree or disciples' practice, which I've already taught. I intend to follow those which were established by the practice of the disciples of the Lord in the early church. And those that were of state decree, I try to make them as biblical as I can. That's what I recommend at this point. You have that liberty. Or if you cannot deal with the truth, I guess you can take your kids to go see Shark Tank. But I don't think it's wise. Because you're teaching them to believe in a myth They title and I, I, I personally like it, and, but it's it's not really correct. They talk about the crucifixion when they put it in the movies as the greatest story ever told. Now that could be extremely good or extremely negative. If by story you mean the greatest fable, that's awful. If by story you greatest reality that ever took place, then you have the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. But see, that's what people fail to realize in their conduct and will worship, that they can, in satisfying their will, completely undermine the But then where has anybody taken the time to teach that to Christians in the last hundred years probably? Now, if we are joined unto the Lord in one spirit and we seek to glorify God in our body and spirit, then it is of great importance whose spirit comes from us. But Job answered and said, Hast thou helped him that is without power? How savest thou the arm that hath no strength? How hast thou counseled him that hath no wisdom? And how hast thou plentifully declared the thing as it is? To whom hast thou uttered words, and whose spirit came from thee? If your spirit is to be the spirit of Christ, it must be a spirit of truth. And if it's a spirit of truth, it will declare Christ in truth, not in fable. It will be a story of reality and not a story of fable. Now, if we are joined on the Lord in one spirit and we seek to glorify God in our body and spirit, then it is of the most great importance whose spirit comes from if you have a doubt about what you do, here are some basic rules by which to judge your actions that are questionable in your mind. First question I would ask is, does it please God? Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Sanctify them with thy word. Thy word is truth. And the truth shall make you free. Free from the deceptions of the world. Free from the deceptions of Satan. I dare say and present to you anything that is not done in truth is not pleasing to God. Would I like the Lord to find me doing it when he returns? But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, so that every one of us shall give account of himself to God. It's not to me or to others, or even what I've taught. It's to the Word of God and the Lord himself that 
you and I will all give account to better consider these things, perhaps take advice, and then speak the truth. Can I ask God to bless you now? Well, if it isn't in line with God, the Bible says we ask anything in his will, and he'll give it to us. But if it's not in his will, then I don't think he'll give it to us. But that's what the scriptures imply. Can I ask God's blessing now? And God's blessing is very important. The blessings of the Lord that make us rich, and he had us no sorrow. Now, the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's what you get when you live the truth, speak the truth, walk in the truth, live for the truth, and love the truth. Would it cause a weak Christian to stumble? Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Now what we're talking about here is meat that's been offered to idols. We just recently had the privilege to enjoy the liberty of the Lord here in India. And of course, they have the sacred cow, and if you do anything to harm or hurt a cow, they get a, they'll have a cow. Special. And uh, so our host went over to the Muslim section in India where they kill the beef and sell it. Therefore, if my meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh. But I didn't harm the cows in India because it would have just got people hurt. But wouldn't it be good news in those tiny folks if they just started slaughtering those cows and everybody had a treat over it? That'd be so good for those people in India. I see so many skinny people in India with good old probably put some joy in their life, but that's the problem of religion. Religion blinds us, and the religion hurts us. And that's the difference between religion and sound doctrine and the truth of God's word. Would it cause an unsaved person to reject the gospel? Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither the Jews nor the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. So when in India, I did not attack a sacred cow. They would just see me as an evildoer. And I did not eat their sacred cow until someone brought it from the Muslim section. And obviously, Muslim section that wasn't radical. Or we wouldn't have been able to buy it from them as Gentile Christians. If you are a Christian, you belong to the Lord in life and you belong to the Lord in death. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Now how a Christian lives and how a Christian dies is of the greatest importance to the Lord. What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. It is pertinent for a Christian to study the scriptures and learn God's truth and live in a way and walk in the spirit, obedient to the spirit of truth. People that are saved die in different deaths. Ananias and Sapphira, saved Christians, died in corruption. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold her possession 
he kept back part of the price. His wife also being privy to it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. They were putting on airs. They sold a piece of property, let's say, for a hundred bucks. They told everybody we're giving a hundred bucks. They gave fifty, kept back fifty. They're seeking glory at God's expense. So Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost to keep back part of the price of the land? The Holy Spirit slew both of them. Say, where'd they go? They went to heaven. Their sins had been paid for on Calvary. But their walk with the Lord was corrupted. And the Lord put them down as castaways and slew them and took them home. A lot of Christians died that way. Now, Stephen... Stephen died in faith. This is the way that God would have all of us. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now what a Christian testimony. This young man goes through the short, brief history of the Jewish nation reveals the betrayal, and this is where the accusation justly is applied, we have taken the just one and crucified him and slain with wicked hands. And then he's killed. He dies a martyr's death. From their perception, they just killed an evil and wicked man. God's perception, this is one of his best. You know how we like to make ballads and stories. You know, it's really good in the military. You know, like fighting soldiers from the sky, fierce men that jump and die. Well, God would have a ballad for Stephen, faithful soldiers. dies like a Christian. He lives like a Christian. The context here then is regarding questionable things like special days or diets. You cannot say a person is not in faith or spirit, saved or lost, simply because he treats things different, distinctions, and special days or diets. And Christians should be fighting about those things or arguing about them. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? They shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Now, I had uh, brothers that came to this church, and uh, they were so predisposed that they knew how unscriptural Christmas was. So when we're singing Christmas songs coming up to Christmas, some of those Christian Christmas songs are wonderful songs that glorify the Lord. They wouldn't open up the songbook and they wouldn't sing. It's fine with me. We don't want to have joy. Now, as I already covered, I try to keep Christ in the Christmas, and I try to keep Christ in Easter without paganism. And I get brethren that get mad at me because I don't want to have the paganism. I had grace for them. We don't want to sing joy to the world, the Lord is come. <laughs> don't sing, but don't make it hard on me because I like to sing a godly song. Well, all don't give account to God. This is the first message mention of the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, which is a judgment of Christian's work after his redemption. It has absolutely nothing to do with redemption, but everything to do with reward and inheritance. The Christian sins have already been judged at Calvary. And I've taught this for years. When you repent of your sins and trust Christ, your past sins, your 
presences and keep your fingers in it. And you cannot be lost. You're in the stages. You can lose your character, you can lose your reputation, you can lose your inheritance, <clears throat> you can lose your life, you can lose your health, you can lose your wealth, and you can lose everything but your soul. <clears throat> so it is not recommended to lose on God. So you got brethren today that are teaching just that. Well, we got liberty, so we can do anything we want. Well, the Bible warns you about those times. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Galatians 3.13. Being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come on the Gentiles, though Jesus through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. As his ambassadors, we stand reconciled and righteous in his redemption. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be a reconciled to God. For you have made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now a good ambassador comes into our country from other countries in the world. A good one comes in and respects our laws and our ways and our customs, and then tries to show his and exhort through virtue in them. And that's pretty much an ambassador for Christ should behave. But if he's a good ambassador for his nation, he will not violate his nation's laws or ways. He will abstain with our ways and corrupt his ways. However, we shall suffer great loss or perhaps earn great rewards by the goodness or corruptedness of our ambassadorship when we as ambassadors give account. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done whether it be good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God and I trust also are made manifest in his conscience. Since we are redeemed there is no reason to judge one another anymore. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Now the context here is not in morality or church discipline, but in questionable activities as days of worship, holy days. Sin is always to be dealt with scripturally. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily am absent in body, but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, it's very simple. Modern churches are no longer exercising church discipline. Since we are to be harmless as doves, and we are to be wise as serpents, church discipline does not incorporate bringing harm to people, but excluding membership, people that are harming the body. Cast out the scorner and content in his way. Christian churches should never and have no authority to bring any form of corporal punishment. But they have every right to request and demand Jesus be anointed to evict the rebellious individuals that are causing dissension and disturbances in the church. A Christian must make moral judgments involving godliness. 
I wrote unto you an epistle, not to comfort you fornicators, yet not to altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetousness, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must you need to all the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called to his brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or drunkard, or an extortioner with such a one, no, not he. Or not to fellowship with disorderly conduct. Disorderly conduct has to do with morality and ethics, not with respect and holy living. Our judgment is restricted to expelling, expelling and separating. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judges. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. But as for questionable religious things, they are not righteousness, peace, and joy. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if any brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, going not him with thy meat, for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Conclusion. It all sums up, and we'll finish this chapter. For he that in these things feareth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbles, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that commendeth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubted is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. In other words, there's only one right way. There's only one truth. There's one hope, one faith, one spirit. You and I are responsible to study the scriptures out, to know the truth, and to live and walk in the truth. And those that fail, that are not causing disorder, tensions or strife. Let them alone. Those that are corrupted with the fornication and sinfulness, if they will not repent after being dealt with strictly, cast them out. That's what the Bible teaches the body of Christ should be. Have a good night. God bless.